We borrowed a music stand from Bob Chapel, who is from the drama department, and he directed 1776, which is playing at the Heritage right now. And he told me that last night was an amazing night because, first of all, the musical is about the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, Thomas Jefferson, our founding fathers, and it's very timely right now. But he said that Terry Sullivan was there last night, and so he got up on the stage before the show started, and he told the audience that this musical couldn't be more meaningful than it is right now, and it's about the the things that UVA should stand for. And then he pointed to her in the audience and he said, and I'd like to introduce you to the president of UVA, Terry Sullivan. And it was an amazing moment and everyone gave her a standing ovation. You know what, maybe. I think that's really neat. I'm just gonna see if I can pull it off. And he'll be here today. Wanna to join me in the day? Oh, thank you. Is that guy plugged in? Yes. Oh, it is. Okay. Do you want? Do you need this now? No, thank you. Watch out for these wires. The gentleman in the wheelchair. I was uh, just in there, so they had something to Hey, John, what are you doing, man? All right, everybody, this is a mic check. Let me hear you make some noise. Come on. This is a rally, not a funeral. Let's hear it for, Pre for President Sullivan. Come on. 
Let me hear a wah hoo wah. Let's hear that one more time. Wah hoo wah. All right. Volunteer if you haven't. Drink some water. It's over here. Thanks. Check. Oh, is he? Okay, yeah. Well, listen, I'm going to give this to you. Showing up on my phone, but I don't know what that means exactly. So. But Rosalie said she was watching. She would be watching. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Looks pretty good. And same thing with my feet. Oh, hello. <laughs> Is this good? Brilliant.
Testing. Testing, one, two, testing, one, two, testing.
Hello? Testing, one, two. That's great. Excellent.
Mic check. How's everybody doing? Sorry, I've been sort of a slow communicator.
It's called a rally for us, university students and faculty gathered on the lawn of the squad. They do white power buildings in the back of the protest, which is to construct and institutions to organize the state of the world down to 15,000 strong white program. Thank you so much. No worries. Let's go. 
going to start in a few minutes. If you are a speaker, you need to check in on this side of the rotunda. And if you're with press and you haven't checked in, you're welcome to uh, check in on this side. But we'll be getting going pretty soon as soon as everybody gets done talking to the press up here. Thank you all for coming. There's a scary man. Hello, everybody. This is Mr. Jefferson's University. Thank you for coming. I'm Daniel Enbaum from the McIntyre Department of Art, and I'm here to introduce our speakers this afternoon. All the speakers who come from all parts of the university, and all of you who come from all parts of the university community are here for the same reason. We're here to affirm the values that underlie this institution, the values of rational discourse, of civility, and of honor. This is a student-organized rally. And I speak for the entire faculty and indeed the university as a whole by saying how proud we are of students who will come forth to defend Mr. Jefferson's university. We have a very full schedule this afternoon, and so I won't take up any more of your time. I'll introduce the first speaker. I'd like to ask speakers to please come up and be waiting, uh, uh, come up when uh, the speaker or two ahead of you is announced so that you're up here and ready to go when your name is called. 
The first speaker who will give introductory comments on behalf of the Faculty Senate is Peter Norton, Assistant Professor, Department of Science, Technology, and Society, and Chair of the Policy Committee of the Faculty Senate. Please welcome him. Thank you, Daniel. We come from many, many different perspectives, but today we're united by one common value, honor. I thank the organizers of the Rally for Honor and thank every person here, physically or remotely, or in the form of pictures stapled to stakes, for making this happen. I'm here at the organizers' invitation to represent the Faculty Senate, and by extension, the faculty of our university. The Faculty Senate supports the positive message of the organizers of the Rally for Honor. I thank all my colleagues on the Faculty Senate. Two weeks ago, many of them were familiar faces. Now many of them are dear friends. Though I'm here to represent the Faculty Senate and to express our solidarity with the organizers of the Rally for Honor, I find that since June 10th, the distinctions between the population that, that compose our university, the faculty, the students, the staff, and the alumni have become insignificant. We've come together for a common cause. Our energy is awesome and positive. Following the reinstatement of President Sullivan on Tuesday, <laughs> that powerful energy will guide our university through the rapidly changing environment of higher education. The board, if it chooses well on Tuesday, will be amazed by the productive and positive energy we have to offer. As I've crossed these grounds, I've been struck by how their beauty and openness contribute to an atmosphere of civility in which collegial dialogue can thrive. Those were not my words. I've quoted them. I predict you'll hear Jefferson quoted more than once this afternoon. So I wanted to quote the words of our president, Teresa A. Sullivan. It will be a surprise to no one here that in her inaugural address, delivered January 11th, 2010, in the dome room behind me, President Sullivan spoke wisely about civility and collegial dialogue. These values seem to guide her conduct at every meeting she attends and in every speech she gives. Most presidents are good speakers, but we are blessed also with a president who is also an exemplary listener. In the last two weeks, in the last two weeks, however, we have seen failures of civility and collegial dialogue. Perhaps the first was the failure by those interested in a new direction for our university to engage the president in collegial dialogue about their vision. The advocates of this vision, to their credit, have admitted this failure. And since then, there have been failures of civility on both sides. But these failures are as nothing compared to the awesome collegial dialogue we have witnessed and participated in on these grounds since June 10th. Today's rally is yet one more instance, and much of the credit for this civil and collegial dialogue is due to President Sullivan. This is where, if this were a paper from a student, I would write evidence, question mark. So, <laughs> President Sullivan, through the Day of Dialogue, respect at UVA, and other bold, unprecedented, and non-incremental initiatives, has fostered a culture of civil and collegial dialogue that is a model for universities nationwide. Some say our reputation has been damaged, perhaps it has in some ways, but I'm sure you've noticed that since June 10th, we've been building a national reputation as a university community that is more committed to each other and to excellence in higher education than any other in the world. Some people suppose that bold visions and incremental planning are incompatible. President Sullivan's record proves the contrary. Bold visions succeed when they're founded upon careful incremental work. Incrementalism is a new catchword for an old virtue, one of the four cardinal virtues we've inherited from ancient Greece. It's called prudence. 
Some people confuse prudence with timidity, but philosophers say that prudence is the optimum point on the continuum of courage between timidity and recklessness. In an environment of rapid change, we need a prudent leader to guide us. We are fortunate to have such a leader in President Sullivan. President Sullivan was a bold visionary to start the day of dialogue. It took a bold visionary to start respect of U at UVA. It took a bold visionary to lift the curtain on our university's finances so that the taxpayers of our commonwealth can see where the money goes and so that we can find and eliminate inefficiencies. It took a bold visionary to demand that the faculty become entrepreneurs who take responsibility for the financial health of our university. But any successful researcher will tell you that their boldest accomplishments were built upon a solid foundation of hard incremental work. Set loose from the foundation of patient incremental effort, bold visions become dangerous. A case in point might be the plan to dismiss the president, which appears to have been based on insufficient incremental work. Those, those who devised this plan would presumably be the first to agree. But to be fair to them, they are in good company. Many others have made the same mistakes. The mistake that incremental effort and bold action are incompatible, and then failing to build bold action on incremental work. There, there was very bold action at Enron, at Arthur Anderson, and at Bear Stearns. Does anyone remember the Edsel? If you need to, check Wikipedia. It's E-D-S-E-L. With bold action unguided by incremental effort, we might become the Enron of higher education, or the manufacturer of academic Edsels. Incrementalism does not preclude bold action. To the contrary, it is the prerequisite to successful bold action. The Apollo 11 astronauts spent less than three hours walking on the moon. When NASA was founded in 1958, such a walk was surely the boldest of visions. The astronauts brief visit 11 years later, and Apollo's extraordinary and bold success was the product of a decade of patient work by tens of thousands of unsung incrementalists. Many of them in universities led by presidents who appreciated what their incrementalist researchers had to offer. They provided a sure foundation for the bold visionaries these universities also housed then and today. So our university's community of renowned researchers, faculty, graduate students, and undergraduates can offer some advice earned through training and experience. Recently, we heard the contention that while the process was admittedly flawed, its result was correct. I quote, we did the right thing the wrong way. Our researchers would respectfully suggest process and result cannot be dissociated. If the process is deficient, the result is unreliable. Researchers report their methods carefully because a bad process will yield an unreliable result. When this happens, good researchers will not proceed. They will not say, well, we got the right results the wrong way. They begin again. So if, in fact, flawed methods culminated in the conclusion that our president should resign, we suggest that the conclusion is unreliable. It needs validation through more reputable methods. To those we see, to those who see our president as a barrier to our university's best future, we ask, make the case, begin again, and in the meantime, please reach no premature conclusions. In <laughs> indispensable to the research process is the quality control mechanism of research. We call it peer review. Sound peer review by outside experts is never a challenge to the researcher's authority. It is, it is a formal consultation method that prevents errors promotes reliable work, and gives results credibility. Good researchers do not see peer reviewers as a threat or as an obstacle, but as their best ally, because they catch the flaws the researcher missed. If, as any, everyone agrees, the process culminating in the president's resignation was flawed, let me suggest that the absence of peer review was the flaw that enabled all other flaws. We, we the faculty, offer our services as peer reviewers to the Board of Visitors. I want to conclude by thanking the Board of Visitors for doing the right thing. They were right. 
On January the 11th, 2010, the Board of Visitors unanimously elected Dr. Teresa A. Sullivan our president. The following, the following two years demonstrated the wisdom of their judgment, and the proof lies among you in the unwavering support you and thousands of others have given to her. The Board of Visitors have the opportunity now to prove that it was right in 2010. It can make allies out of thousands of dedicated champions of our university. We thank the board for its wise decision in 2010 and ask them to stand by it by reinstating President Sullivan. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker will be a man who, in my time here, has always been one of the most popular professors at the university. Kenneth G. Elzinger. Robert C. Taylor, Professor of Economics in the Department of Economics. Thank you, Mr. Anbaum. My name is Ken Elsing, and I teach economics at UVA. I'm an unlikely person to speak at this rally. By nature, I am not drawn to demonstrations or collective action of this sort. In addition, as a person who for many years has served on the board of trustees of another college, I have great respect for the principle that the board hires and fires the president of a college or university. A board of trustees or a board of visitors in our situation has only a few responsibilities. Selecting the president is one of them. But I believe our board of visitors made a mistake in calling for Terry Sullivan's resignation. I thought so at the time, and the events of the past several days have confirmed this. From my perspective, Terry Sullivan's performance as president of this institution has been exemplary. The first time... The first time I, I met her was not in Charlottesville, but in Los Angeles, where each of us was speaking at a UVA fundraising event. Terry had just become president. This was her first trip on behalf of the university. She gave a great talk, but what really floored me was that she already knew the words to the good old song. All of them, by heart. I've been told that I've taught more students at UVA than any other faculty member in the history of the school, around 40,000 40, students. I can't say that I've heard from all 40,000 of them, but I can tell you this. Every communication I have received from former students has been one of disappointment at Terry Sullivan's forced resignation and desirous of her reappointment. UVA has only had eight presidents. I've served under five of them. It would be inappropriate for me to rank the five, but I will say, in every circumstance I've encountered Terry Sullivan, whether it's been at a lunch at Cars Hill, speaking before hundreds of alumni, or the winsome manner in which she attends and watches a UVA wrestling match, or listening to her speak to an audience of faculty, or her compassion in caring for the parents and grandparents of a beloved student of mine who died from a fall off the roof of the physics building. Whatever the circumstance, Terry Sullivan strikes me as the complete package. I hope the Board of Visitors, I hope the Board of Visitors is able to realize that a mistake has been made to admit this and remedy the mistake. It's not easy for any of us to admit we made a mistake. And I can tell you as a board member at another college, it is not easy for a board to admit error and walk back from a mistake. While I teach economics, I think of the world in theological terms, and I've tried to look at this event through a biblical lens. The scriptures are all about atonement, grace, and forgiveness. I hope the Board of Visitors will atone for its mistake and reinstate Terry Sullivan. If the Board were to do so, it would not diminish the Board or its authority. Just the opposite. The Board of Visitors... The Board of Visitors... 
would be enhanced. This is the great paradox. If the board were to reinstate Terry Sullivan, most of us will come away with a renewed appreciation for the board because its members demonstrated the courage to walk back from a mistake and atone for an error. If the board were to reinstate if the board were to reinstate Terry Sullivan, the virtue required of us, faculty, students, staff, and alumni, is that of grace for the Board of Visitors, not condemnation. Part Part of the genius of this university is that, as Mr. Jefferson instructed us, this is to be a place where, in his words, we tolerate error. So more than any other institution, we should tolerate error graciously, and when error is corrected, to accept this with gratitude. And may I mention one thing we must ask of Terry Sullivan if she's reinstated. And this also is not something done easily. To flourish as president, she must be able to forgive those who sought her resignation. Now, very few people can demonstrate outwardly, much less in their hearts, true forgiveness. It's not easy to do. You know what? The Bible says it's not supposed to be easy. Recrimination and revenge, that's what's easy. That's why true forgiveness is so noteworthy when it happens. Forgiveness and then healing is what our university needs at this time. Not lawsuits, not commissions, not investigations, not years of ill will. Um, those, those of us at this rally must model out forgiveness so there can be healing. And I believe Terry Sullivan, with all of her administrative skills, is the kind of person who can forgive. And of this I'm confident she will be empowered to do so if those of us who seek her reinstatement do so as well. I've already dated myself in this talk. Uh, in closing, I'll do so again by citing one of the last speeches given by Robert F. Kennedy. Uh, he was paraphrasing words from the Gospel according to John, and they're the words written across and above the columns of old Kennedy, old Campbell Hall. Kennedy said, for today, as it was in the beginning, it's the truth that makes us free. The truth of the matter is that all of us regret the forced resignation of Terry Sullivan. All of us respectfully ask the board to atone for its action. And all of us, I trust, are prepared to respond with gratitude, forgiveness, and renewed enthusiasm to be part of UVA. Thank you for your attention and your devotion to this university. Thank you. Now you see why he's been so popular all this time. Our next speaker is David W. Brenneman, the Newton and Rita Myers Professor in Economics of Education, Department of Leadership, Foundations and Policy in the Curry School, University Professor, former Dean of the Curry School, and former Director of the Batten School of Leadership. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we're only three speakers in, and I can already see common themes emerging. I'm honored to speak at this student-sponsored rally to, to discuss recent events at the university. I've been privileged to serve both the Curry School of Education and the new Frank Batten School of Leadership and Public Policy in my 17 years here. It is a, as a representative of the Batten School that I speak to you today. My remarks are addressed to the students of the university, as this is your event. As students, you are experiencing a profound and unexpected lesson 
and contested organizational change. Be alert to the lessons of leadership on display and try to learn from them. As a graduate student at Berkeley in the late 60s, I lived through years of a university torn apart by violent protests against the war in Vietnam, against our leadership in Washington, and against the governor who fired a respected university president for his even-handed approach to student protests. Those years were marked, by the, were marked by the presence of armed police who used tear gas in the Central University Plaza and pepper gas sprayed from helicopters to quell demonstrations. Those experiences had a profound effect on my thinking and learning and also my lungs. <laughs> and I remember them much more vividly than I do many of my classes. Since the announcement of President Sullivan's forced resignation, you, the students, have made your support for her clear and have conducted yourselves with the civility, respect, and honor that defines our university. I suspect you will look back years from now and realize that these two weeks and what happens next will be not only among the most vivid memories of your time here, but also among your most profound learning experiences. You are participating, but you're also watching and learning from the behavior of important leaders in your life. Let me suggest that the members of the university's Board of Visitors are among your significant, most significant teachers at this time. As I come from a school with leadership in its title, let's discuss, discuss briefly the recent actions of the board from that perspective. I believe in general that board members are good and thoughtful people, committed to their beliefs about the best interests of the university. Their disagreement with President Sullivan involved the nature and pace of change required by the difficult economic environment. Viewing President Sullivan as not responding rapidly enough, they forced her resignation. All involved would now agree that the board misread the likely response of the university community. <laughs> what happens next, and Getting it over, folks, as you probably know, will be a lesson in leadership and character. One view is that the board must insist on its legal and statutory right to hire and fire the president. That to reconsider would be a sign of weakness that would cripple the board and erode its ability to set university policy for years to come. I understand that view, as I serve on several nonprofit boards myself. I would argue that for the board to persist on its wildly or widely unpopular course would be an error, not a sign of strength or vision. True leaders have the wisdom and the courage to embrace new understandings and change course. And here's a key point that have to make. In doing so, they gain trust and enhanced, and enhanced authority that comes from the consent of those governed. From this perspective, the board has an opportunity, <laughs> has an opportunity to strengthen its role and the esteem in which it is held. Similarly, if President Sullivan is reinstated, she has a responsibility to work seriously and expeditiously on the areas of concern expressed by the board. Having clearly established the trust and support within the university community, she will be in a strong position, indeed the strongest possible position, to lead as we address those issues. We have gathered this afternoon on the lawn in the heart of Mr. Jefferson's vision of a university that would develop human potential and preserve the public good through higher education. 
Today we stand as witnesses to a remarkable test of leadership that will shape this great institution for years to come. With our students and an entire nation watching, I hope and pray that the members of the Board of Visitors will think of themselves as teachers and take this opportunity to instruct the next generation of leaders on how best to act in tough situations with wisdom, integrity, humility, and courage. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Our next speaker will be Dory Fontaine of the Nursing School. Sadie has cabinet as professor of nursing and dean of the School of Nursing. And she is accompanied by Marcus Martin, Vice President and Chief Officer for Diversity and Equity at the University. Good afternoon. I titled these remarks, What Nurses Know and Why We Want Our President Terry Sullivan Back. Nurses are no strangers to pain, sadness, loss, and grief. We see it every day in the patients and families we care for, and we train for resilient and compassionate responses to these emotions. As Dean of the School of Nursing, I have watched over the past two weeks the way we have come together to share this loss and grief. Reports of sleepless nights, crying, feeling shame, and now anger have all been reported. Despite our sadness, my colleagues have sprung into action to let the Board of Visitors and our community know that this unjust action of the Board must not stand. We are united in asking for our President to return. Everyone quotes Thomas Jefferson, but I'm quoting Martin Luther King. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent on things that matter. This matters and we are not silent. So President, President Terry Sullivan understood that a relationship-based model of leadership that was inspiring to my school and to all my fellow deans and vice presidents. She was everywhere. Every sporting event, yes, including wrestling, Every church in the community giving a sermon the day she was um, asked to step down and attended as many events at every school as possible. In my own school, President Sullivan would come early to events and not leave until she had spoken to each student and faculty member. She has style and grace and much courage. Can a relationship-based leadership style also lead to measurable, accountable fiscal solutions and outstanding outcomes, I am confident the answer is a resounding yes. So, it is very ironic that President Sullivan's three laws of administration, which she provided to the deans and the vice presidents when she started in 2010, they are instructive to us now. Marcus, you're going to remember these. First, never surprise an administrator. <laughs> Second, find the resources and get control of them. And these include human capital. Watch and care for good faculty and staff. And finally, don't leave anyone out who ought to be consulted. <laughs> President Sullivan lived her values with all the deans and vice presidents here with respect and honor, integrity and trust. Our provost, John Simon, another hero these past two weeks. Yes, John. Hope you're watching. He stated to the search committee, which I was on, exactly one year ago in June 2011, that UVA should not try to be MIT or Stanford or even Duke. But UVA needs to be the best UVA it can be. So my fellow deans and faculty believe we were on a path not to mimic others, 
but to achieve levels of excellence that others will and already do envy. So, in addition to grief and sadness, nurses know about healing as well. Yes, healing. So after Tuesday at 3 p.m., we shall come together to hopefully celebrate our president's return. I have been waking up, some of you know this I've been saying, I've been waking up with the image of President Sullivan riding the Cavaliers horse Sabre up to Cars Hill with the UVA flag. It's kind of a Joan of Arc moment. But nurses do know about healing. And as we encourage our Board of Visitors to act with courage and wisdom, we shall all find the fresh courage needed here to support each other and be the very best we can be. We shall also need to move to forgiveness, as well as dedicated action for shared governance. I am proud of all the faculty senators for their courage and resilience. They are role models for our students. I am confident we will emerge stronger, bolder, and a wonderful community. I'm so very proud to be part of it today. When the narrative story of this is written, it will be one of courage, wisdom, and justice. Thank you so very much. All right, I stand here to form my colleague. Thank you all for being here so very much. I'm gonna be very, very brief. My name is Marcus Martin, and I'm a professor of emergency medicine and I'm the Vice President and Chief Officer for Diversity and Equity. I stand here in support of my colleague, Dory Fontaine, and all of you here. I stand here as a father of three children who are alums at the University of Virginia. I stand here as a physician, a faculty member, a researcher, and an administrator. And I stand here as a member of this greater community and the Charlottesville community. It is time to reinstate President Teresa Sullivan. You should have access to the statement that I issued earlier this week uh, on behalf of the Office of Diversity and Equity. My staff and I support the reinstatement of President Sullivan. My family supports the reinstatement of President Sullivan. My three children who graduated from here who are alums support the reinstatement of President Sullivan. My grandchildren who I hope will come here support the reinstatement of President Sullivan. And I do. I ask you one question. As I ask the students that I take to the West Indies, when we study healthcare and disaster preparedness, every morning I always ask them, what time is it? What time is it? It is time to reinstate President Terry Sullivan as the president of the University of Virginia. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Lee Grossman of the School of Medicine. She's Professor of Pediatric Medicine, Chief of the Pediatric Infectious Disease Division, former Vice Provost of International Affairs, and Associate Dean of International Programs in the School of Medicine. Thank you, Dan, and thank all of you for inviting me to speak today. In 1975, I came to the University of Virginia as a pediatric intern. Joining this medium-sized university in a small southern town, a university that prided itself on being Mr. Jefferson's university. At that time, I didn't know what that meant. UVA at that time had only recently accepted women undergraduates. There were only four women in the graduating medical school class. There were no full professors on the medical school faculty. And the changing rooms in the operating room were for doctors and nurses and there was no place for a woman doctor to put on scrubs. We had black and white wards and a huge divide in public and private patient care. The last 37 years has seen incredible change. <laughs> our schools and our classes have equal number of men and women. We ranked in the first or second spot for public universities. Our schools, our departments, centers, research programs, clinical service, and national and international programming matches that of any university in the world. We are diverse, we are cosmopolitan, and we have worked hard for equal access and equal opportunity. Our growth continues. Two years ago, this university selected Teresa Sullivan 
as our president, and we quickly learned that we had recruited one of the finest academic administrators in the country. Over her short tenure here, President Sullivan has proven herself worthy of her reputation. And until Sunday, the 10th of June at 11 a.m., I had never heard a negative comment about her. How can that be? Everyone is impressed with her knowledge, her experience, her expertise, her wisdom, and her grace. She has endeared herself and garnered the respect of students, faculty, administrators, and alumni and donors from across Brown, across the country, and around the world. Our growth continues. She then hires two senior administrators over the past year and begins to create her goals and move towards incremental implementation. Our growth continues. And then the news hits. Teresa Sullivan is forced to resign by a board. Well, no, not the whole board. <laughs> Because she and the board have philosophical differences. I have spent my entire career in, academ in academia because philosophical differences are the foundation of learning and are actually the celebrated purpose of the academic tenure process. to resign with no process? The Board of Visitors, well no, not the whole board, <laughs> have acted in corporate fashion, a style which may be required in the business world, but is the antithesis of what we teach and require of you, our students. This bold move has set us back decades. So why? So why, after 14 days of student, faculty, alumni, donor, and national and international outcry by our academic colleagues and the press, including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the New York Club, of, and the Association, um, the American Association of University Press of Professors, etc., have we lost two weeks of focus, two weeks of work, thousands, if not millions, of alumni don don dollars, sorry, loss of future applicants and recruited faculty and expenditures for public relations and damage control, which by the way is not working. <laughs> to see no change in the board's position thus far. In fact, the only real leadership we have seen during this turmoil has been by our president, who has insisted that we honor the real strengths of this great university to honor and respect those philosophical differences and use them as a platform for steady and incremental growth. Thus, I conclude by saying, and probably all of us here today do, I want to return to the work that we are here to do. To do that would require the immediate reinstatement of President Sullivan so that we cease spending our precious resources on this flawed decision and reaffirm that we abide by the values of honor, respect, and justifiable action that only our President has so gracefully role modeled during this entire debacle. Only then. Only then can we continue to grow. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Our next speaker is Catherine Wall of the School of Nursing, Associate Professor of Nursing, Department of Family, Community, and Mental Health Systems. Hello. You just heard uh, my dean, Dory Fontaine, speak and tell you about some of the things that uh, nurses know. And I'd like to add to that skill set that nurses have a long and proud history of social activism and political action. So I'm speaking here today as a double alum of the university and a relatively new tenured member of the School of Nursing faculty. Junior enough that when the organizers told me to keep my speech to three minutes, I believed them. <laughs> 
In my years here as a student, and now a clinician, a teacher, and a researcher, I've learned that this university, like its founder, Thomas Jefferson, combines both greatness and flaws. Despite our flaws, I remain deeply committed to this institution, believing that our community of trust is the ideal environment in which to create the needed change. Teresa Sullivan, although relatively new to the university, has only strengthened that trust. My nursing faculty colleagues are proud to belong to a university led by a woman of the stature and integrity of President Sullivan. She has consistently displayed honesty, forthrightness, and integrity. She is a bold leader and a visionary widely acknowledged to have a tremendous grasp of the issues facing both the university and higher education in Virginia and across the nation. Her ability to lead has been proven by the overwhelming response from every constituency of the university in the last two weeks. We have tremendous strengths and resources at this institution, many of which can be seen today. The intellect and engagement of our students is demonstrated in their incredible organization of today's rally. The devotion of alumni across the country is shown by their presence here and the 5,500 alumni comments that crashed the Alumni Association server this past week. and the emergency department clinicians with whom I work are at the highest caliber and incredibly dedicated to keeping this university, as President Sullivan said last week, one of the world's great universities. We believe the Board of Visitors has acted in good faith thus far, with additional information now available and in the face of the overwhelming community support for Teresa Sullivan, however, a new course of action is clearly needed. We ask that the board heed the words of Thomas Jefferson. It is more honorable to repair a wrong than to persist in it. <laughs> Give President Sullivan an opportunity to address the concerns of the board. Allow for transparent, open dialogue between the board, the administration, and the faculty. Reinstate Terry Sullivan. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. And the sign reminds me that the university archivists want signs used in these rallies and demonstrations. So keep that in mind. Don't throw them away. Give them to the university. Let them become part of the permanent archive. Our next speaker is Anne M. Coughlin of the Law School. She's Lewis F. Howell, Jr. Professor of Law and Joel B. Piasek, Research Professor of Law. of Virginia. We are students, staff, faculty, administrators, alumni, and friends. We have come here today to this place, to our rotunda, to the heart of our university, not as bystanders, but to, to assert our right to participate in a dialogue with the Board of Visitors about the future of our president, Terry Sullivan, and about the future of our community of trust and honor. Okay, so I'm a lawyer, and as a lawyer, I am a big fan of process, what we call due process over at the law school. And I've been talking about process and due process for many years, but it was only in the past couple of weeks that I experienced in a personal way the meaning and the feeling of the absence of due process. When, when word came down that the Board of Visitors was trying to remove President Sullivan, I experienced the news as a blow, almost as a literal blow. The decision to remove a president is a grave and momentous one. It requires careful, process. It requires notice, discussion, dialogue, debate, articulation of thoughtful reasons for the decision. 
As we now know, as we now know, there was no such process. Indeed, it appears that there was no process at all. And it's for that reason that I felt the decision almost as a literal blow as I understood for the first time that the absence of due process is experienced as the presence of force. Yep. I believe that the Board of Visitors has learned a lot from this experience, too. Our rector has apologized for the consternation, the confusion, the pain that she has caused to all of us. And therefore, I am hopeful that I'm hopeful that the Board of Visitors will be willing to listen to our views, not merely about process, but about substance, and that they will move swiftly to reaffirm that Teresa Sullivan is the president of the University of Virginia. When Terry Sullivan became our president, one of the very first things that she did was to initiate a day of dialogue across the grounds. And for our discussion, she recommended that we focus on a specific question. And that question was, are we a caring community? In the sessions in which I participated, because I'm a lawyer, I made everyone focus on the precise meaning of the word care. And after that, we spent a lot of time talking about the ways in which we can care for each other as individuals, care for our community collectively, and find ways to stamp out injustice wherever it's found. As we left the session, I dare say that none of us was thinking that there would come a day when we had to step up and express our care for Teresa Sullivan. My thought at that time was I was safe, I was content, I could rest easy in her care. After all, she's the president, it's her job to care for us. But the wisdom that came out of that day of dialogue was the ultimate one, that we need to express our care for every member of the community, however great, however small, and we need to step up today and express our care for Terry Sullivan. That's why I'm here. I hope that's why you're here as well. So please, we care. Terry Sullivan, care. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I want to thank you for being here once again. And I want to thank you for your enthusiasm, for the power and the passion that all of us, you, the university, every member of the community, everyone has brought to bear on this important issue. I think you should all applaud yourselves. Our next speaker will be from the Darden School, Elizabeth A. Powell, Assistant Professor of Business Administration. I'm grateful that the organizers of this event invited me this morning to uh, represent Darden's voice at this rally. My reasons for being here are profoundly professional and personal. I have two degrees from the University of Virginia. I have been a past leader in the Faculty Senate. I have taught for 18 years at the Darden School, where, oddly enough, I teach leadership and crisis communication. <laughs> One of the things that I talk with my students about when I teach uh, leadership presence and, and choosing moments to speak, I say, speak your mind from the heart, even when your voice shakes. I'll admit that my voice is shaking a little bit now. Not perhaps for the reasons you might be thinking. I'm here because I'm profoundly proud of the Darden School and its solidarity with the University of Virginia 
as demonstrated by Dean Bob Bruner's signature on the Dean's letter to the BOV, asking for the reinstatement of Terry Sullivan. those who are gathered here today not to fall into an easy trap. The easy and available discourse of, you know, the problem with business people. I challenge you to have more discernment and judgment and wisdom and refrain from stock stereotypes about our students and our school. The day that this story broke, uh, I opened up a discussion board online for my students. And uh, these are my MBA for executive students who are working professionals who are actually still in school and in fact during this crisis have been in exams. But some of them took the time to share their thoughts and I'd like to hear, like you to hear their voices. What I find most fascinating about this whole ordeal is BOB's communication strategies. There may be very good reasons president, uh, the president was asked to resign. Who am I to pass judgment on the decision when I have no proximity to the issues? Maybe universities must transform through sacrifice in order to stay at the edge of innovation and to be financially sound. But that's not the discussion we've been engaged in by Dragas. The conversation Dragas and the BOV has engaged us in is one of negativity and drama and speculation and shock and disunity. Some of my students are even weighing in with ways to see, see us go forward. Number one, the justification for change must be presented with intellectual honesty. Okay. Of course, we all think we are acting without bias at, time, at, at all times, but in truth, that is not typically the case. Thus, our motivations must be kept in check when developing justifications for change, and we must take care not to present fallacious arguments. Timing is everything. Who knows? More community members might have disagreed with Dragas' assertions had she presented them publicly and prior to taking action, allowing discourse that would have helped shape the outcome in a sober, methodical, and collaborative way. And this from one of my students who attended West Point and is a decorated veteran from the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. I have been captured by the ongoings at UVA, and likely my exam scores will be proof of how much. <laughs> Motives, strategy, vision, core values, communication, enterprise, the institution, shareholders, leadership, management, negotiation, and brand image. All of these things that we learn in hundreds of cases at Darden are important forces and motivations at play as our beloved school struggles to find a way forward. In the days ahead, some might consider this as a dark period for the institution, but I am hoping it could be in fact one of our finest hours, especially if the ideals of Jefferson's faith and the common person and the principles of Jeffersonian democracy hold true. Trust lies at the heart of this university. Let's see it restored in the coming days. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you to our friends and allies in Darby. Our next speaker is John Nicholson, who, like me, is from Wisconsin. He's the William R. Keenan Jr. Professor of Classics and Interim Chair of the Department of Classics. He asked me to point out 
He asked me to point out that he's wearing a Virginia classic t-shirt. And I can also affirm that he knows German. The first faculty hire by the University of Virginia was a Latinist, George Long. And he lived and he taught right over there. Uh, he was the first resident of Pavilion 5. The Board of Visitors who recruited and hired him consisted of a rector, who was named Thomas Jefferson, uh, and two other members, James Madison and James Monroe. Three presidents, I should say, not of corporations, not of companies, but of the United States of America. I speak of classics today because we have been brought into the current discussion and news reports about this crisis. That was a mistake. A mistake we have tried to correct. We did not want to be in the focus, a focus. We did not want to be a footnote in this turmoil. But people seem, almost instinctively, uh, to want to make us a symbol or a part of what the University of Virginia has been, what it is, and what it should be. And that part of the University of Virginia is liberal arts education in the College of Arts and Sciences. <laughs> We now are happy to embrace that new role, and we are honored that it has been thrust upon us, and we think we can fulfill it. We have now in the Classics Department more faculty, more graduate students, more undergraduate students, more courses than Classics has ever had at UVA. We, we are strong. We are Virginia Classic, yes! <laughs> On the facade of Old Cabo Hall behind you, uh, there is an inscription in letters one foot tall, in Greek letters. It reads, Genosis Atene Aletheon, Kai Haike Aletheia Eleutherose Humas. What does it mean? You need a classicist now? <laughs> it means you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We, the faculty and students of classics, want to know the truth. And we want a president who understands, represents, and supports liberal arts education. We want President Sullivan. Thank you, John. May I take this opportunity to ask any speakers who are in the audience who have not yet come up to please come up now so that we can get you ready to speak. We're concerned about the possibility of a thunderstorm coming. We'd like to get as many speakers in as possible before that happens. Should that happen, please take shelter to the sides, but we will, if we can, we'll continue. Our next speaker is Mitchell Green, NEH Horace Goldsmith Distinguished Teaching Professor of Philosophy from the Corcoran Department of Philosophy. Good afternoon. It's an honor to have been asked to speak, and I'm grateful to all of you for coming out on this sultry afternoon. When news of President Sullivan's dismissal was made public on June 10th, we were told that the event was a result of philosophical differences between her and the Board of Visitors, or at least certain members thereof. Having a passing interest in philosophy, 
This explanation piqued my curiosity, and so I was eager to hear more about what those differences were and how they could have led to such a dramatic outcome. I was expecting differences of opinion about whether essence precedes existence, <laughs> about whether we possess free will in a world governed by physical laws, or about the biological basis of consciousness. Instead, I learned that the difference in, differences in question involved revolved around such issues as the pace at which President Sullivan was effecting change on grounds and the means by which she proposed to do so. For instance, while certain members of the Board of Visitors have expressed breathless enthusiasm for the prospects of online education, President Sullivan has been clear that this area is a highly speculative one in which no distinguished university is, at least thus far, making money. Again, while Rector Dragas has complained in a recent widely distributed letter that the university has not formulated a strategic plan since the year 2002, President Sullivan has remarked that she has been told since her appointment by the Board of Visitors not to formulate such a plan. <laughs> These are differences, all right, but to call them philosophical suggests that they are too abstract or speculative to merit reasoned discussion, or, or at least to make possible the hope of a resolution. This would be a mistake. The minutes of the Board of Visitors will surely answer the question what that body has said to President Sullivan about strategic plans. Likewise, a sober assessment of the prospects of online education makes it clear that it's, terribly ex it's a terribly expensive enterprise that might help promote a university's brand globally, but is a problematic source of tuition revenue. Nothing very philosophical here, alas. This is not to say that there are no differences of approach between certain members of the Board and President Sullivan. However, what I resist is the suggestion that to call those differences philosophical is to imply that they are beyond the pale of reasoned discussion. As one of the core disciplines of humanity, as one of the core disciplines of the humanities, philosophy is devoted above all other things to the giving and asking for reasons, for answers to difficult questions. You're not doing philosophy when you merely assert a grand position. What's instead required is coming to the table with a putative answer to a hard question and giving the best reasons for it that one can. This is what the Board of Visitors has stunningly failed to do. Instead of approaching President Sullivan in the spirit of, hey, you know, we're really worried about some challenges ahead and we'd like to be convinced that you're doing enough to address them, and then going on to describe those challenges in detail, the board summarily dismissed her. Instead of finding out about the progress that faculty and administrators have made in transitioning the university to a so-called responsibility center management approach to fiscal organization, the board appears to have concluded on the basis of little or no evidence that the university is in a business as usual mode. This is what Emmanuel Kant would have called dogmatic slumber. <laughs> And pundits from elsewhere in the nation have been reinforcing this refusal to engage. For instance, Ann Neal, president of the American Council of Trustees and Alumni, has asserted in a recent Richmond Times Dispatch piece entitled, Time to Innovate or Die. She writes, if institutions want to remain viable, trustees are going to have to demand leaders who innovate and think differently. If the president does not move in a direction that encourages fiscal efficiency and accountability, then the difficult decision to change leadership will have to be made, unquote. Now, this sounds eminently reasonable to me, but one wonders why Ann Neal thinks that these platitudes would justify firing anyone around here. As I mentioned above, apropos of the RCM model, Responsibility Center Management, my colleagues and I have, been, have seen more encouragement of fiscal efficiency and accountability in the last two years than we had seen for quite some time. Again, Ann Neal writes, I quote, it bears remembering that those in Charlottesville who are now enraged are the same folks who have for decades resisted cutting costs and providing accountability to the public eye, sorry, to the public that they serve. While surveys show that the public believes universities can do more and better with less, faculty and administrators simply don't agree, reflexively asserting that quality requires more money. For them, enough is never enough, end of quote. I would reply that I and most of my colleagues can provide excruciating detail 
about how we spend our time in education, outreach, and the creation of new knowledge. But this is not to deny the imperative to do more and better with less. Higher education is one of the few major industries that have failed to see dramatic improvements in efficiency in the last 50 or so years. The reason is that it's far from clear how we can become more efficient without compromising standards. Education is incredibly labor intensive, and the most obvious ways of economizing on that labor, huge lecture courses, multiple choice exams, and the like, don't hold much promise for maintaining academic excellence. But contrary to what Ann Neal would have one think, we as a faculty are open to ideas as to how this apparent limitation might be addressed. All evidence I have seen suggests that President Sullivan is as well. Here is what I would like to see as a satisfying, perhaps even inspiring outcome of the choices that need to be made in the next few days. The Board of Visitors will, I hope, see the wisdom of reinstating President Sullivan with the expectation that she should at least be given a five-year run to prove her mettle. And As well, those on the board who have concerns about President Sullivan's stewardship of the university will engage in meaningful, patient, and informed dialogue about the very real challenges facing this institution and how they might be addressed. Those dialogues may or may not produce agreement among all parties, but they bid fair to allow each side of the table to discern where the other is coming from and why. That would be a case of philosophical difference. So far, however, some parties in the current dispute have yet to rise above the level of dogma and I urge them to try some philosophy. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Let me remind speakers again, please, those of you who are scheduled to speak, please come up here now. Our next speaker is Peter Onuf, the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation Professor of the Corcoran Department of History. Peter has asked me to remind you that he's the only person appointed to speak for Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> Peter. And I've also been asked to make it short and sweet. And I want to tell you folks that this is the happiest moment of my career at the University of Virginia. If I were Thomas Jefferson, and I am the only licensed speaker for Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> I would be looking at you today and saying, this is what I envisioned at my academic school. Professor of Religious Studies, the Department of Religious Studies, Director of the Virginia Center for the Study of Religion and Co-Principal of Brown College, and Ricardo Padron, Associate Professor of Spanish, the Department of Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese. <laughs> Ricardo and I are here today to uh, represent the more follically challenged among us. <laughs> And we wanted to start today by thanking, actually, the Board of Visitors. Uh, and that's a sincere thanks. First of all, uh, these are very serious people who work very hard and for no money at all for the good of the institution that we all appreciate and enjoy. And though they sometimes may make mistakes, we ought to understand that they are doing the best they think they can. And we do mean to thank them seriously. Secondly, there's another thanks. Because without their work, 
in these last several weeks, and it turns out several months, we would not have known this. This is the most important revelation of the past two weeks in UVA. Not the ham-fisted attempt to compel a president to resign, but the discovery that we ourselves all collectively do and care far much more for this place than we thought we ever could or did. I'm both a faculty member here at UVA and an alumnus. I arrived here when I was 18 years old and have been associated with the University of Virginia since then as a student, as an alumnus, as a faculty member for more than half of my life. And in everything I've seen about this crisis, one person has gotten it right. Many of you saw this in the Washington Post article of last Friday. A young man was interviewed, Patrick, 19 years old, UVA student. And he said to the reporter, sorry, I'm usually not this intense on things. It's just that everything that I respect and value about UVA is wrapped up in this. Over and over again, they stress to us honesty and trust. And then this happens. I am here today, and I believe many of you are here today, because you know that the University of Virginia is about something. Yes, it is about research. Yes, it is about excellent education. Yes, it is about patient care. But more than anything else, it is about honor and integrity. And if we have learned anything from this experience, we faculty, we administrators, we staff, it is that our students are listening when we talk about honor and trust. Like many of you, I will be here on Tuesday to keep vigil while the BOV makes their decision. I will not be here to chastise them. I will not be here to criticize them. I will not be here to call them on their behavior, which has been so out of keeping with the central values of this institution. I, and I hope you as well, will be here to welcome them and encourage them so that they will be able to right the wrong and they will be able to show our students what honor and integrity look like by reinstating President Sullivan. from each of us. First of all, although this has been a tremendous honor and experience for all of us to actually engage in the sorts of things that we all in our classrooms as students or as teachers, in our staff positions as alumni, give lip service to the virtues of Jeffersonian self-governance. Here we get the chance to do it. But it's important to understand that things are very much still up in the air. All of us feel much more connected to UVA perhaps than we did two weeks ago and also so much more anxious about the future than we did two weeks ago. And the Board of Visitors' actions on Tuesday will tell us which of these two emotions will win out. Ironically, UVA can come out of this far stronger than it was on June 8th. But only now the Board of Visitors has the power to make that happen. They must build on our academical rebellion to affect real and permanent change at UVA. Rector Dragas is right. The time for incremental action of some sort is over, and we are the new strategic dynamism. I'd like you to know, I wasn't checking my email. I was looking for my quotes. This from Thomas Jefferson. I offer this as advice to the board as they come here on Tuesday. Though you cannot see when you take one step what will be the next, yet follow truth, justice, and plain dealing, and never fear their leading you out of the labyrinth in the easiest manner possible. The knot which you thought a Gordian one 
will untie itself before you. Thank you. And may I say, I'm part of that policy challenge faction for the reinstatement of Terry Sullivan as well. Thank you. I also want to say for those of you who wish to send respectable, respectful messages of support for Terry Sullivan, at the information desk, there is a sheet that has contact information for the board, the governor, and state representatives. Our next speakers are Susan Freeman, professor of the Department of English, and Brad Saylor, a UVA staff member from the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. I'm very proud to be standing here next to Brad Saylor, a member of the hardworking classified staff. I want to begin by thanking all of you, and especially those who've taken the lead, for what continues to be an extraordinary show of solidarity. As a result of our collective efforts, we are now on the verge of reinstating President Sullivan. This will be a wonderful and important victory. But what I want to say today is that reinstating the president is only the first step. Her firing was not only an injustice in its own right, it was also a symptom of a larger, ongoing threat to the academic mission and humane values of this university. The threat that is of private sector, profit-oriented corporate values and practices contrary to those of a public, non-profit school of higher education. Even if President Sullivan is reinstated, she will need our support in countering this threat, resisting this pressure, and acting on the mandate we have given her. Genuinely shared governance will require all of us to remain mobilized on behalf of our core values. We will need to consider not simply whether rapid or incremental change is best, but what kind of change we want, or in some cases, do not want. We will need to continue rallying for honor in the sense of truth and also in the sense of adherence to what is right. Here briefly is my personal wish list for the future. One, I would like to see elected voting members of faculty and staff included on the Board of Visitors. If schools who would be accepted to the University of California can have boards representing multiple constituencies and walks of life, so can we. I would like to see a steadfast commitment to our mission as a public university accessible to an economically and racially diverse group of students. As we know, UVA has not always been open to all, and even today, we have not yet achieved full inclusion at every level. Clearly, a generous financial aid program is crucial to reaching this goal, especially in light of climbing tuition rates. I call on us to fiercely defend current levels of financial aid. Has questioned the logic of so-called merit-based raises for faculty. Faculty salaries are already lagging. Without across-the-board raises, these salaries will not only stagnate but actually diminish in real terms. In my opinion, the notion that only a few star faculty are deserving of raises is both specious and divisive. against further outsourcing of maintenance and other services as a cost-cutting strategy. The DOV has recently seen fit to 
race starting wages for staff from 1065 to 1130. But even this modest gain will be meaningless if jobs are increasingly contracted out to companies paying minimal wages. I would like to see us question the rush to online teaching as a quick fix, much less as a cash cow. Before anything else, we will need to evaluate the academic and economic merits of existing courses, starting with those offered since the 1980s by our own School of Engineering. Among the egg-headed professoriate, this quaint practice of laboriously gathering and analyzing information as the basis for drawing conclusions is known as research. And finally, I would like to see us resist the automatic promotion of profitable sectors over others deemed less profitable. Just as English cannot function well without classics, so faculty and students cannot function without librarians, custodians, and administrative staff. Faculty, students, and staff, we are all voting members of this academical village. Now that we have found our voice, now that we have proved there is strength in numbers, I urge us to stand together for as long as it takes to safeguard the values of academic integrity, broad accessibility, caring community, and equitable working conditions for all. Thank you. I'm one of roughly 6,000 staff workers in the academic division at the University of Virginia. I can tell you that staff members at this university are opposed to the Board of Visitors' decision to remove Terry Sullivan from her position as president. And we strongly disapprove of the process used to arrive at that decision. Academic and hospital staff represent one of the largest constituencies at the university. Yet we are often overlooked when the discussion turns to the betterment of the university. I would like to think that if the Board of Visitor Visitors had previously included one or more elected staff representatives, our current situation might have been avoided. An individual on the board, intimately familiar with the joys and challenges of working with faculty and students every day, brings a different perspective and a refreshing dose of reality to the discussion. In an open letter to the University of Virginia community last Wednesday, the department chairs of the School of Engineering and Applied Science said, we call for an immediate and newly reconstructed Board of Visitors, both in terms of its structure and its membership. We, we strongly recommend that the Board of Visitors be structured to include broader university representation, including students, staff, and faculty, in a significant way. Both William and Mary and Virginia Tech have seen the wisdom of including staff representation on their boards of visitors. Governor McDonald and the University of Virginia should follow the lead of these peer institutions and add a minimum of one elected voting staff member to our board of visitors. The time to act is now. Let's work together to make this happen, to reinstate, to reinstate Teresa Sullivan, and to create a better University of Virginia. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Jahan Ramazani, Edgar F. Shannon Professor of Modern and Contemporary Poetry from the Department of English. Hello, good afternoon, and thank you very much for being here. I appreciate the invitation to speak. We all have various connections to the University of Virginia that bring us here today. But for better or worse, I was actually born in the University of Virginia, or more specifically, the UVA Hospital. 
Because I went home as a newborn to Piedmont faculty housing. I'm afraid I was probably even conceived in the university. <laughs> so I don't plan on asking my parents for verification. My dad taught here for about 40 years. I was an undergrad here around the same time as the current rector. So I don't just teach here, and I don't just visit here. I was conceived, born, swaddled, fed, reared, and educated at the university. No wonder, no wonder my head has begun to resemble an inverted Jefferson cup. Many of the people closest to me have UVA degrees, including my father in law, mother in English, brother in French, sister in psychology, and wife in English. If I carry a label, I'm afraid it would probably read something like 98% UVA or ingredients, UVA, comma, salt. <laughs> so what would you do? If the main item on your ingredients list were devalued in one fell swoop by a disastrous decision, in this case, the removal with no faculty consultation of our smart, savvy, and humane president. What would you do if those three letters, once happily wound into your identity, UVA, suddenly turned out to be like other three-letter strings, BPA, that stuff in plastic bottles, if such a loss befell you, after the usual stages of denial, anger, bargaining, depression, the fifth stage wouldn't be acceptance. No, as Jefferson remarked, whenever things get so far wrong as to attract their notice, the people, if well informed, may be relied on to set them to rights. Now, what would you do if, having served as a faculty senate chair and a student judiciary committee member, you saw the university's deep traditions of shared governance in tatters? Amid attempts to remake UVA as a corporation, though strangely one barred from pricing its own product, and to reallocate resources away from their liberal arts. If you were 98% UVA, you maybe cite the university's statement of purpose and goals. And I quote, the central purpose of the University of Virginia is to enrich the mind by stimulating and sustaining a spirit of free inquiry, including enlarging the intellectual and creative capacities, as well as the aesthetic and ethical awareness, and fostering in students a disposition for applying the most rigorous criticism to all ideas and institutions, and to sustain liberal education as the central intellectual concern of the university. If you felt those principles were in danger, you might prepare at behest of the Faculty Senate Executive Council a worst case scenario plan for convening if the board votes against us on Tuesday, the Assembly of Professors, an autonomous group comprising all faculty that has come together to deliberate openly and assert the will of the faculty in crises such as the Vietnam War and Chev's 1992 intrusion. How can we rebuild this quake-stricken academical village where we stand? into a place of open debate, collaboration, and free inquiry. How can we help bring the university out of its darkest days back into sunlight? How can we turn ourselves from an, from an embarrassment into a radiant example of the best in higher education, a faculty and a university community that refused to be cowed or silenced, that acted with courage and conviction to show, as our founder said, that light and liberty go together. How? 
how you know how, whatever your connection with UVA. You've been doing it the last two weeks by your deeds and words, and you're doing it now by your very presence. You're showing all who have eyes to watch or ears to and ears to listen that we, faculty, students, alums, friends, call resolutely and in unison for the reinstatement of President Sullivan. That whether we were born here, or work here, or study here, or live here, we are UVA, if with a little salt, and maybe even some pepper. Thank you, Thank you Johan. You've all been very patient, and I want to remind all of our speakers especially with the potential of bad weather coming, that everyone needs to speak very briefly from here on in. And our next speaker assures me that he will be a model of brevity. <laughs> Michael Suarez, Professor of English, Department of English, University Professor, Honorary Curator of Special Collections, and the Director of the Rare Book School. I will be uncharacteristically brief. <laughs> Thomas Jefferson loved learning and he loved books. And among the books that was most prevalent in his three libraries was a book called Plato's Republic. He owned at least seven copies of Plato's Republic during his lifetime. He owned them in Greek and in Latin, in French, and in German. He studied philosophy. He could read the languages because, ladies and gentlemen, he had received a liberal arts education. <laughs> Unbeknownst to Mr. Jefferson, laboring away in Williamsburg, Virginia, that liberal arts education that study of Cicero and of Plato would stand him in very good stead when his fellow founding fathers would call upon him to write the Declaration of Independence. And in Plato's Republic, Jefferson would have known that one of the most important words that Plato highlights in his Republic is the word thumos, Passionate action. Action driven by passion. We are gathered today because of our thumos, because of our passion. I urge you this day to call the governor's office, to write to the secretary of the Board of Visitors, to contact the foundation boards of your school. I urge you to enjoin upon others to tell them now for the time to act is now. Tell them now that men and women in this community of all religious faiths and of none have faith in honor, have faith in the ideals and high purposes of this university, and that we have faith in Teresa Sullivan as the embodiment of those ideas. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Our next speaker, Douglas Gordon, Associate Professor of Art History from the McIntyre Department of Art. Remember, Douglas. Now, here I'm, I'm seeing the speakers listening. We're nearing the end. You're hardcore. I read a fascinating opinion piece by David Brooks recently. It was titled, What, was the th what is the Third Estate? Now, I'm just paraphrasing here, but it noted that in this tumultuous age of capital accumulation and downward mobility, the terms like the middle class might not be that helpful anymore. 
Right for recuperation, however, is the term the third estate, which is much more encompassing. In fact, in 18th century France, it encompassed almost the entire country. The article then laid out a series of helpful hints for recognizing how, whether you may or may not belong to the third estate. You know you are in the third estate when you are worried about whether you will be able to pay for your own or your child's education. You know you are in the third estate when you stand outside rallying for things like peace, fairness, and honor. And you know you're in the third estate when you wake up and read the morning paper to find that the president for the university for which you worked has been asked to, re to resign. Now that I think about it, David Brooks may not have written that article. So let me start again. I trust President Sullivan because she places respect, courtesy, and dignity for individuals ahead of abstract theories like strategic dynamism. <laughs> I trust President Sullivan because she recognizes that collaboration will be necessary to meet the challenges of this century. And I trust President Sullivan because she seeks consensus from a diverse constituency she has already proved herself uniquely capable of uniting this community along the principles of fairness and honor, and she is the one to lead us forward and through any crisis that we may need. Thank you, and thank you for hanging in here with us. Thank you for your patience. We've got about 15 minutes to go. You've been a great audience, and I hope you will continue to listen to what we have to say. Our next speaker, who has also assured me that he will go no longer than three minutes, is Lewis Nelson of the School of Architecture, Associate Professor in the Department of Architectural History. Hello, everyone. So, I just returned from a glorious six-month sabbatical at Oxford University. As a visiting fellow at Oxford, I roamed freely through the colleges, from the early medieval quads of Merton to the spectacular Victorian quads of Peeble. But it was not just the physical spaces and ancient traditions that impressed. Oxford is an extraordinary physical place, abounding in intellect. I reveled in the opportunity to be part of that community, if only for a season. Steeped in mystery and antiquity, there's just no place like Oxford. But an academic sabbatical always gives one the opportunity to reflect on the place you have left. No matter how engaging or enchanting Oxford may be, it is no UVA. <laughs> we, too, have an amazing physical environment. The sophisticated classical clarity of Jefferson's original vision was realized through what was at the time the largest building project in the new nation, this university. It is a landscape so compelling that we argue with deeply held and vital passion about expanding on that original vision. Here at UVA, we have a deep and abiding commitment to intellectual engagement, one that freely jumps disciplinary boundaries. My classes are not populated entirely by architectural historians or that would be a small class indeed. <laughs> My classes, some of a hundred or more, are filled with students from architecture and history, yes, but from religious studies, biology, sociology, and business, intellectually curious students who wonder about the power of architecture to shape our lives. These students are not going to be architectural historians. They're going to be great citizens. Here at UVA, we have a culture of honesty, integrity, open debate, peer evaluation, and transparent governance. These virtues manifest in this place have over time created a distinctive academic community. Fashioned from the ideals of classical democracy, there is no place like UVA. I was sitting quietly in my office at Oxford when I first read the news. Stunned by the sweeping and seemingly final judgment of the Board of Visitors, I scoured the media for some justifiable explanation to no avail. Over the course of the afternoon, I faced questions from my colleagues at Oxford. 
I could offer no rationale. Such measures stood contrary to the tenets I knew to define my university. Maybe, in fact, UVA is not so distinctive after all. I touched down at Dulles at 2.30 last Monday, and I was here on the lawn by 5. For the next nine hours, I stayed and conversed with colleagues, alumni, locals, and students, while the Board of Visitors deliberated behind closed doors. In the midst of this community, that community, and this community, I was reminded what makes this place great. Strong leadership, clarity of mind, rigor of analysis, abundance of commitment and dedication, tempered with wit and good humor, classical ideals manifest in the ancient grandeur of this place. Now, we all recognize that the university, in fact, all of higher education, faces an uphill climb. In the face of that climb, these virtues embodied in the people of this community is what sets UVA apart from our peers. <laughs> Two weeks ago, this beautiful community was torn asunder. But there is hope for reconciliation. I call the UVA Board of Visitors to make the right choice to reinstate President Teresa Sullivan on her terms and in, do, in so doing, to rejoin our distinctive community of honor, integrity, and trust. They are welcome back. Thank you, Laura. Our next speaker will be Olivier Fister, Professor of Experimental Atomic, Molecular, and Optical Physics in the Department of Physics. Good afternoon. I am a quantum physicist. In my laboratory, a stone throw away from here as the raven flies. My student and I researched the wave particle duality of light in quantum computing. Over the years, I participated in strategic planning at UVA. I wrote several reports, some of which even contained bold architectural designs. So when President Sullivan mentioned faculty fatigue in her memo to the Board of Visitors last Monday, I knew exactly what she meant. But what's kept me going and keeps me going all these years without fail is to work with and teach our students. Together, we create new knowledge. And I also transmit as much knowledge as I can to them. And when the transmission goes the other way, these are my proudest moments. I do not believe that what I just said is any different in philosophy than it is in physics. This is why university has the same root as universal and universe, Latin for the whole. This is a vision that I know President Sullivan shares with us. The recent events were a breaking point for UVA. We might either emerge seriously damaged or actually stronger than we've ever been. I want to praise here the Faculty Senate for proving its mettle and providing strong, poised, and unwavering leadership with laser-like focus. I have never felt prouder to be a UVA faculty member. The heart and soul of the university are the faculty and the students and the alumni. President Sullivan knows this. Honor shapes the relationship between students and faculty, defining a community of trust, 
There is no community without trust. We are all here together to speak to this core value. The University of Virginia is a unique historic and architectural site, but it, it is also a community of scholars that is very much alive. As faculty, it is up to us to embody the standards of scholarship and honor. I trust President Sullivan can lead us on this path because she had already started So yes, we do need to look ahead, understand how the world is changing, it always is, and plan for the future, but we do need to do it together. Having a diverse pool of visitors, including faculty representation, who can stay consistent with their initial choice of President Sullivan and work with her openly can only strengthen our university. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Laurie Richards, professor in the Department of Mechanical and Aerospace Engineering. Hi there. I've been back cutting my remarks to try to make them shorter so we can beat the storm. But I do need to remind you all that Thomas Jefferson was an engineer, an architect, a scientist, and the first commissioner of patents and founded the Patent Foundation. So that you know that those of us on the other side of the bridge there do have a heritage with Thomas Jefferson. When we were reading the, the exchanges of emails between the Board of Visitors members uh, and met, read Ms. Dragas' message to the university community, they cited another article by David Brooks, this one called The Campus Tsunami. And that was given as justification for radical change at UVA. The Board of Visitors fears that we will miss the revolution in higher education and lose students to those schools who embrace online learning. Unfortunately, their knowledge about distance learning is flawed and limited. They didn't do their homework. There's a lot that needs to be studied. Let's try to separate the hype from the reality. You know, things are not as they seem. David Brooks talked about two experiments. One is Udacity, which incidentally has two faculty members from the University of Virginia teaching in their program. The other is the MIT Harvard experiment, edX. Now, edX's first course, Circuits and Electronics, enrolled 120,000 students, but only 10,000 made it through the midterm exam. Those who complete the course will get a certificate of mastery, but no official credit. Udacity and something called the Khan Academy are really marvelous experiments in distance learning, and they provide great resources for education. Indeed, I use some of their material in my class as supplements. But these are not university programs. They don't charge tuition, they don't get degrees. They're free to all students because of the wealth of their founders and the support of Bill Gates. Admission is based solely on interest. Students are free to drop out at any time without penalty. In a recent keynote address at the uh, Sloan Consortium, Udacity founder Sebastian Broom noticed that in his 2011 graduate class, he had 160,000 students enrolled, but only 23,000 actually completed the course at the expected level. By contrast, I've taught in distance education programs from 1983. If I lose a single student out of 100, I get very disturbed by it. I call them up. I say, what's wrong? What can we change here? The student that dropped my course last semester tells me he's going to take it next term. He dropped out for financial reasons. So, I've got much more here than I cut out because I promised that I was going to be short, but I want you to realize that the University of Virginia has been a leader in distance education for a long time. We have state-of-the-art technology. If you don't believe it, just wander into the basement of our new Rice Hall. We have dedicated faculty members who have been working in this program for many years, and we have students who, for one reason or another, cannot complete degrees at the University of Virginia. They have undergraduate degrees, but they come here to get graduate degrees. Some of our students get high school degrees, and some of our students enhance their undergraduate degrees. 
So since 1985, we've been doing distance education at the University of Virginia, and we've been doing it right. Now, I should mention, I'm from engineering, but I know that things are happening in the, professional, the School of Continuing and Professional Studies, the Curry School, nursing, McIntyre, and Darden. In fact, I learned that approximately one-third of Darden Executive MBA curriculum is delivered by a distance learning. So, we do it well. We've done it well in the past. We were all looking forward to Teresa Sullivan's management uh, new budget plan where the resources go to those places that generate the resources. Because if we actually had things coming back to the distance learning programs in proportion to what we contribute, we'd have a whole lot more money to make it better. So don't believe everything David Brooks tells you, and we hope that the Board of Visitors takes that to heart. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. We're in the final stretch, and our next speaker is Sharon Davis, director of the Women's Center. It's actually Sharon Davis. <laughs> President Sullivan is not a great leader because of her gender. She is a great leader because of her strong, deeply caring, and boldly imaginative leadership. But the impact of diversity at the presidential level is obvious. Many of us, men and women, have been proud that given the specific history of this institution of exclusion, of exclusion of women, of exclusion of people of color, are two examples, that this university has been able to see beyond traditional thinking to great leadership. So many women graduates of this institution have contacted me and asked me to speak about this. When I have traveled across the country from LA to New York with President Sullivan, when she's been giving receptions, uh, inviting women graduates of the university, I have found them to be proud and full of admiration. Their admiration is for President Sullivan, but they feel pride too that their alma mater, which did not admit women fully into the college until 1970, has changed as the ability to see extraordinary leadership when it appears. I felt grief when I heard about the board's action. I've been out of town since then with almost no access to email. When I came back, I found this, the extraordinary strength of your words of your actions, whether you're students or faculty or alumni or friends or uh, staff or uh, donors, uh, it's, it's been amazing. I hope you believe, as I do, that a university is its people. When the people together find a voice and speak together in that voice, the power of those people and that university is extraordinary. Change is possible. You know that. So you know that Teresa Sullivan will be reinstated as the president of the University of Virginia. Thank you, Sharon Davies. Our next speakers will represent students. Johnny Drew, the President of the UA Student Council, and George C. Trevon, Chair of Communications, the Arts and Sciences Graduate Student Council. There it goes. That editorial statement by the wind about keeping it brief. Firstly, um, I would like to thank the UVA community for reaffirming my faith in my in our school and its stakeholders, because the response from every angle is a sign that our core values are very much alive and well, and should serve as an indicator that students don't just come here to get a degree, but they come here to be part of the UVA family. And part of that family is fighting for the future of our institution in times of turmoil. And I can unequivocally say that due to the response, I have never 
been prouder to call myself a UVA student. But I would also like to echo the sentiments of Governor McDonald and call on the board to make a final and definite resolution to the situation at hand. Because no matter what your point of view, I think that we can all agree that stability is necessary and that the uncertainty that has been present over the past two weeks is tearing at the fabric of our school. Students tend to view the honor system as very straightforward. You don't lie, you don't steal, and you don't cheat on exams. And it seems simple, and the consequences of breaking the code of conduct are certainly severe. But throughout this process, we've all become cognizant of the malleability of the honor system. It really does apply to all facets of life at the university and not just in the classroom. It fosters an atmosphere of transparency, respect, and efficiency that makes us a leading university, not just in rankings, but in richness of student experience and in community. The board has admitted that it did not act in line with UVA's traditions and strong sense of honor, and it's understandable that most UVA stakeholders are upset. But I want to stress that we are in the midst of a golden opportunity. This situation has exposed some of our university's inefficiencies and flaws, and we owe it to ourselves to improve and to innovate. It is my hope that future leadership will learn from past mistakes and align itself once again with our core values. We must stay invested in the future of this great institution and always push for what's right, regardless of what that may be. I do ask that the discourse moving forward remain productive and logical. When we fall victim to speculation and rash decision-making, the quest for a better UVA is certainly jeopardized. UVA will remain at the top of higher education in America. We will continue to attract the brightest, and brightest students and top quality professors, and I have faith that our traditions and our values will endure. We are so much bigger than one action, one person, or one board. So to quote Jefferson, do you want to know who you are? Don't ask, but act. Action will delineate and define you. So let's find out who we are. Thank you. My name is George Bravon. I'm the Vice President of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences Council. First off, I'd like to thank the organizer of the rally for giving uh, me a chance to speak on behalf of the Graduate Council and graduate students. Also, thank you to all of you here. It is wonderful to see so many people here in support of honor and the University of Virginia. The graduate student population has appreciated President Sullivan's work towards increasing financial support for graduate students, her work to increase funded research, and perhaps most important, her recognition of graduate students as a critical component of, these, of this university. The speakers before me have all commented on the damage that's been done in the way the Board of Visitors has operated, so I don't need to go into that. But I want to say that Grad Council and the graduate student population has joined with UVA and the rest of the community in calling on the Board of Visitors to engage in more open and honest dialogue. Earlier today, graduate students joined in a town hall meeting to discuss these events. Many graduate students have called for the reinstatement of President Sullivan. The overriding sentiment is one of frustration that the community of trust has been betrayed. Graduate students have also contacted the Council over the past two weeks, expressing their strong support for shared governance. As teachers, future administrators and leaders, graduate students contribute valuable input which benefits UVA. Despite the pain of these events, we have been provided an opportunity to increase cooperation between the Board of Visitors, the administration, the faculty, and the students, all of whom desire the same greatness for this university. We appreciate the Board's action to meet on Tuesday to reconsider their decision. We especially welcome their opportunity to make their decision in a manner that is consistent with the values of UVA. We hope this rally and the Tuesday board meeting will be catalysts for healing. 
While this is a difficult time, it offers the promise of ushering in a new era of transparency and collaboration at UVA. In this is the opportunity to make the University of Virginia even stronger. Thank you. Thank you. We just have a few more speakers, and we're going to end the rally with Susie McCarthy. I know you've all been waiting for her to speak, and she's very much the reason that we're here today. Our next speaker is Stephen Nash, the chair of the Honor Committee. I want to first echo the thanks for all of you for coming out here today, for staying through all this rally, and for speaking up in the name of honor and our community's values. I have spent a lot of time thinking about the events of the last two weeks and what they mean for our community. Some have characterized these 14 days as harmful to our university's reputation and stature. Others question how UVA can fully recover from such a controversy. For me, what is transpiring here in Charlottesville is not causing lasting damage to this institution. In a difficult situation, we are not abandoning our principles, but instead holding them up as the measure of what is right. When students and faculty at other institutions might have let defining decisions go unchallenged and talk amongst themselves in hushed tones, we Wahoos ask questions and speak out for all to hear. Our sense of honor goes far beyond the 16-word pledge that hangs in nearly every classroom. Our honor code requires each of us to act with honesty and integrity at all times and gives us the special responsibility to be not only accountable to ourselves, but to the larger community. So when we use the terms honor, integrity, and community of trust, we are not using them for rhetorical flourishes to be printed in an admissions brochure. These words capture the essence of who we are and what we do down to our very core. To our workers, the emotions and tensions of the last two weeks might seem ugly, but to me, they demonstrate the distinctive values of our university and the exact reasons why we love it so much. The board's actions this past week leave us with an environment that remains inconsistent with the value of trust. While I will let history render the ultimate judgment on the conduct of the board, I do believe that the last two weeks have made clear why our community of trust and its honor system have been so important to us for the last 170 years. We have seen what happens to our community when the foundation of trust is shaken. We have seen what happens when important stakeholders are excluded from critical conversation. And at the same time, we have seen what happens when people stand up to do what is right. The events of the last two weeks have shown us exactly why this honor system has served for so many years as the guiding ethical framework for our community. And your presence here today demonstrates the strength and promise of our community of trust for many years to come. Whether whether you are a student standing in the middle of a rally, an alumnus following what's happening on ground from miles away, or a member of the Board of Visitors contemplating a difficult vote, this community calls us all to uphold our foundational pillars of honor, integrity, and trust. If we stay true to our core values, this university will sustain its community of trust, endure any challenge, and continue to be one of the greatest universities in the country. As we head into the upcoming week and steadily approach Tuesday's meeting, I ask us all to remember the guiding principles that have gotten us here. For as long as we stay true to those ideals, Mr. Jefferson's University and the spirit of this rally will never diminish. I hope to all see you on Tuesday as well. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Our next speaker is Joel Voss, graduate student of the Woodrow Wilson Department of Politics. All right, everybody, I've been asked to keep my comments very short, so I'm going to start at the end. This is not yet a victory rally. Keep that in mind. Much needs to be done. Show up on Tuesday. Show up at the meeting. I'm going to remind you why we are here. I think we're here for three reasons. We're here to rally for honor. 
We are here to rally for the University of Virginia. And this last one is very important. Make sure they can hear you at Cars Hill. Make sure they can hear you in Richmond. And make sure they can hear you in Virginia Beach. We are here to rally for the reinstatement of President Sullivan. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of statements. The Vice Mayor of Charlottesville, Kristen Tacos, will speak now. Good afternoon. I've been asked to speak to you as Vice Mayor of the City of Charlottesville as representative of a community whose state is closely intertwined with that of this university. The mayor is out of town and can't be here, but as far as I know, I think all of the other counselors have been in this crowd. Well, the, yes. <laughs> While we haven't met to take an official position, I'd like to say a few words from my own perspective. If there is anything that I have learned as a city councilor in the city of Charlottesville, is that this community is fiercely committed to transparency in government. Ours is a community of principle. We believe in things like democracy and representative government, like the right of the people to freely assemble and seek redress, like the need for the government to be accountable to the consent of the governed. We all live in the shadow of Thomas Jefferson and James Monroe and James Madison, and we rehash the arguments and quotations of our nation's founders as if they were still with us in our midst. We've even erected a monument to free speech in our city's main street, right in front of City Hall. What the Board of Visitors did while visiting our community two weeks ago flies in the face of all of that and violates the democratic principles we hold so dear. On a Sunday morning, in June, far from the prying eyes of their constituents, the press, or even their fellow board members, three powerful people, none of them educators, none of them elected, made a decision that threatens to damage not only this university, but this whole community's reputation, its identity, and its economy. When our local public schools had their funding cut by the state, our constituents flooded our email boxes with requests that we raise taxes to be sure that we didn't cut back on education. Education, they told us, is a community's investment in its future. This community is committed to education. The notion that it is an important role of government to create and support institutions of learning began with Mr. Jefferson's creation of this university. Our nation's commitment to public education as a means to an informed electorate started right here. But our own Commonwealth seems to have forgotten that. The Washington Post reports today that the state share of UVA's budget has dropped over the past 23 years from 26% to 6%. We now spend only a third per in-state student at our flagship university, what North Carolina spends. We only spend half of what Maryland spends. Now, Charlottesville has always been proud to be known as the home of the University of Virginia. The late Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan of New York once said the best way to create a great city was to create a great university and wait 200 years. <laughs> of course, you've, you've heard me talk about the fact that there are some downsides to having a large university in our midst. Huge areas of our city and county are untaxed property. While the cost of services, police, transportation infrastructure, public works required by the presence of tens of thousands of extra 18 to 22 year olds is largely borne by our taxpayers. Their need for places to live drives housing prices up and pushes longtime residents out of low rent neighborhoods. Large numbers of low wage jobs at the university and food service, housekeeping, grounds maintenance, and health care keeps wages among our poorest residents artificially low. And Teresa Sullivan understands that. Over the past two years, her call for a caring community has spurred and encouraged students, faculty, and staff to become engaged in community matters, giving back to the community that has nurtured and sheltered 
and cherished it for two centuries. But we know that the positive impacts of the university's presence in our community are enormous as well, and endangered by the recent move of the Board of Visitors. The university enriches our community in the arts, in innovation, in job creation, and in the available of all these amazing brains in one place. Yes, clap for yourself. <laughs> John Knapp and William Show Weldon Cooper Center wrote a report in 2007 showing that the total local spending by UVA was more than $1 billion in 2005. University-related visitors alone spent $122 million in 2005, with 1.6 million visitor days. And that's before John Paul Jones Arena was opened. Those visitors were drawn here by the reputation of the University of Virginia and by a desire to be a part of it. If that reputation is damaged, as it most certainly would be by this debacle, it does more than damage the reputation of our community. If those alumni and prospective students and boosters and fans stop coming, the economic impact to our community could be devastating. I urge the Board of Visitors to revisit its decision to remove Teresa Sullivan from the leadership of the university, as some of their own members are, have already urged them to do. And I implore Mrs. Sullivan to withdraw her resignation and return to the presidency for all our sakes. You have one of these? On your way home today, make these calls, please. Thank you. Now, we're, we're, we're at the end. Our next speaker is the organizer, Susie McCarthy. Please pull in. <laughs> 